welcome to the continuation of the theoretical perspectives. And in this section, we'll look at some few more theoretical perspectives and how they try to explain human behaviors. So this section will deal with um, psychoanalytic theory, sociocultural, humanistic, and cognitive perspective. So we we'll start with a psychoanalytic perspective. And as I said, this was an earlier school of thought that has now you know, transformed into a theoretical perspective because people, psychologists, are still holding on to it. And this is rooted in the assumption that behavior is directed by forces within one's personality, which are often hidden in the unconscious mind. Sigmund Freud, who is the originator of this perspective, believes that the mind has three aspects, the conscious, the subconscious, or preconscious, and the unconscious. And within the unconscious are three key personality structures, the id, the ego, and the superego. And he says that it is the working of these three that influence the behavior. So their emphasis is largely on internal impulses our desires and the conflicts that comes out from the unconscious working of these three structures. So they view behavior as the result of clashing forces within personality. Believe that actions have cause, but those causes are often within the unconscious aspect of the mind, the aspect that most of the time we do not have access and we are not aware of. He believed that many of the human motives or impulses are inborn and they are forbidden by society and they are persistent in influencing our behavior. So we'll basically look at how they try to explain human behavior. They believe that these drives are largely animalistic. They are very bad, very harmful, very dangerous to society. So society does not approve of all those edges that are in the unconscious. So what happened? They have been pushed down in the unconscious. So disapproval by society drives the impulses from the consciousness into the unconscious aspect of the mind. But Freud believes that because there is much of the time there is disagreement between the working of the eat, what the eat wants, what the ego wants, and what the super ego also tries to control. Because there's a conflict most of the time they come out unknowingly. So he says that nonetheless, they manifest in dreams. Sometimes we have certain dreams that we do not understand. He believes these are the unconscious activities that are coming up. Or sleep of tongues. He says that there is nothing like sleep of tongue. If you want to call your wife Amma and you mention a cause for Sigmund Freud, he says that is no mistake. You have some a cause definitely in your life that you are trying to hide it. You are admiring somebody like that. You are trying to hide it, but because it's, on your, it's within your unconscious, it has forced itself to come up. So let's look at the forces that you talk about that are found in the unconscious aspect of our mind. It says that the ego is the aspect of our personality that deals with reality. Why doing this, the ego also has to cope with the conflicting demands of the id and the superego. The id is, the ego is very realistic. It's very re realistic. It wants things to be done, you know, not to hurt anybody so much. But the id just wants satisfaction. It's pleasure seeking. It wants satisfaction and it wants it now at all costs. It doesn't care whether you be arrested, whether society will kill you. It wants it and it wants it now. Whilst the superego deals with the moral aspect, we want to put things in check. So he says that the inability of the ego to act, to, to perform its function, leads to anxiety, the feeling of uneasiness within the individual, which acts as a signal to the ego that things are not going well. So he says that once there is conflict between these three, then it is most 
likely that it will lead to psychological disorders. So as a result, the human being wants some kind of consistency. He wants an agreement to be within these three. So what it does is that it employs some techniques or some strategies in order to help resolve the conflict and the feeling of anxiety within the person. And he believes that the tricks or the principles that he used, or the techniques and strategies that he used to handle this, he called them defense mechanism. So he believes that the, 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 the personality structure uses different types of defense mechanism in order to resolve the feeling of anxiety. He talk about repression, that sometimes we want to keep whatever is happening out of our mind. We just want to block it out. And then sometimes talks about we can use projection, which is misattribution. So for example, he says that if a man is, if a husband is cheating you know, on the wife, you rather be accusing the wife of cheating. That is projection that Sigmund Freud talks about. Because of what the husband is doing, he's feeling the guilt, so he rather transfer it onto another person. It talks about displacement, where we redirect you know, the source of the anxiety onto a weaker and a more safer target. So if your boss at work makes you angry, and you know you can't face your boss at work because you may lose your job, you get home and then you start to put your frustration on your children or on your wife. So that is displacement. We redirect the source of our anger. We also talk about sublimation, where we try to put the source of the distress into a more constructive use. So for example, somebody who want to kill, you know, just want to harm people and all that, but society does not support that, will decide to either join the army to become a soldier, will go to war, now he has the lances to kill freely. Or he can decide to go into boxing where when he enters the ring, he can freely beat you and kill you, and society will not do that. So these are some of them. It talks about denial where we try to you know, completely block it from our awareness. You know, sometimes we hear news, says this person is dead. We say, no, it cannot be true. We completely try to deny. Just that we will not feel so the pain and all that. And then you also talk about regression, where sometimes we go back to use a rather immature means of solving that you know, challenge that we have. So these are some of the, uh, 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 the defense mechanisms that Sigmund Freud talks about. We need to, to know them. So that's about the psychoanalytic perspective. Now let's talk about the humanistic perspective, the humanistic perspective. Most of the time it is referred to as the third force or the third you know, psychological perspective that we have. And it is the third force because it was an alternative view to the dominant psychoanalytic and the behavioral perspective. How do they explain behavior? They focus on our subjective experiences of the individual. They believe that individuals you know, are free and are naturally good. So they have their own way of doing things. They should have the freedom to decide on what they want to become. Nobody should force them. They should decide on what they want to become. So people have free will and the freedom to choose their own destiny. It is not their environment that makes them. It is not some genetic that they inherit from people. It is not some, uh, some um, unconscious brain structures, personality structures that are controlling him, which he has no control. They say, no, every human being has control. We make you know, choices on our own, and so we should be held responsible for those choices. Whatever an individual becomes and whatever behavior one will exhibit are clear choices that the person has made. So that is what they believe in. So individual, individual's principal motivation forces is the tendency towards growth and self-actualization. They believe that every human being want to get to a certain level that they feel they have achieved the reasons for which they have been born to be. So the behavior is guided. For them, see, every behavior that we exhibit is guided by our subjective perspective of the world and the morals for personal growth. We do, we engage in A, 
type of behavior and not be because we believe this is how the world is and we make a clear choice to do what we want to be. So they can say for them, somebody will decide to become a lawyer because he thinks that is the profession that is good for him. By being a lawyer, he might have fulfilled all you know, his life aspirations and that is what they do. So that is about the humanistic theory. There are several people. One of the proponents of this theory is Abraham Maslow, who believed that human beings are moved by the need to self-actualize. And so once we satisfy one need, we want to move on to the next level and stuff like that. So that's about the humanistic perspective. The next one I want to talk about is the cognitive perspective the cognitive perspective. The cognitive perspective believes that our internal personal factors, our cognition and our affective interacts with the external world to influence our behavior. So they believe that human behavior can be understood in terms of how the individuals process information mentally. It is the mind. They believe that it is the mind that controls our behavior, whatever decision that we take, it is how the mind pick information from the environment, how it process it, and then the outcome of it. So they are more concerned with issues of how people think, how people remember, how people store information, and how we use information. So if our brain is very functional and we can pick information, think about it, reason, and process it, we will be able to take good decisions. So they are interested in how thoughts, expectations, language, perception, problem solving, consciousness, creativity, memory, decision making, and good judgment help to explain behavior. So these are the factors that when they are explaining behavior, these are the things that they will be talking about. And then we have the sociocultural perspective. And this is coming from both social psychology and cultural psychology. It is based on the assumption that people's behavior cannot be studied without the reference to diversity, cultural diversity. They believe that whatever you find yourself, the culture also has a role to play. The way people smile in one culture is different from the way they smile in the other. Even the way we greet, for some people, they have to slap each other and things like that. So they believe that for us to understand human behavior, we equally have to understand their cultural setup, their cultural setup. So they believe that individual personality, beliefs, attitudes, and skills are learned from others. And it is difficult to fully understand a person without first understanding his or her culture, his or her ethnicity, and he saw a gender identity and other important sociocultural factors. So that is the focus of sociocultural perspective in understanding behavior. And finally, we have another approach which is called eclectic approach. This approach basically does not hold on to any of the above that we have looked at, but they pick and select. If you think this aspect of behavior you want to explain, biological will give you more meaning to that, then you rely on biological. If you think that um, sociocultural will explain it better, then you fall on it. So for them, they use all of them at any point in time. They don't align themselves to a particular one. So this pers perspective combines all the major perspectives to explain behavior as opposed to the use of only one. It's a combination of all the perspectives. So these are the various you know, theoretical perspectives that we need to understand in this level of our learning in psychology. Thank you.